Chatting with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. What the Ontario government no doubt hoped for was a quiet, safe, and uneventful holiday season. It sure didn't turn out that way. Instead, deadly COVID outbreaks in long-term care, halted vaccinations, and a luxury vacation that cost the Premier his senior most cabinet minister. Tonight, we check in with the new Minister of Finance for Ontario, Peter Bethlen falvey Then we'll size up the government's task to get things back on track with members of the Queen's Park Press Corps. It's Tuesday, January 5th, and that's next on The Agenda. Ontario has a new Minister of Finance, and as you know, it's happened for the oddest of reasons. Former Minister Rod Phillips took a December vacation to St. Bart's in the southeastern Caribbean, despite a government directive for all of us to stay home over the holidays. Even worse, his office tweeted out pictures of Phillips apparently hard at work in his riding, which critics have labelled a deception. Phillips resigned last week, and Peter Bethlen Falvey, who already had one of Cabinet's most important financial jobs as President of the Treasury Board, well, he's now adding a big job as Finance Minister. Peter Bethlen Falvey is the MPP for Pickering Uxbridge and joins us now from the Frost Block at Queen's Park. Minister, first of all, Happy New Year to you and thanks for joining us on TVO tonight. How are you? Pleasure to be with you. Happy New Year. And I'm doing well given the circumstances. So well, thank you. let's start there. Can I assume this is a job that you feel uh, qualified to have and eager to do, uh, but perhaps um, did not necessarily want to get under these circumstances? Definitely not the, under these circumstances. Uh, you know, it, uh, uh, it's been a tough period for, for many for many in Ontario, and, and so not the circumstances. But, you know, I did spend two and a half years as president of the Treasury Board, as you mentioned, I continued to do that role. And I did spend uh, pretty well my whole career, my whole career in the financial markets uh, have been in New York and Wall Street and half uh, here in Bay Street uh, in Toronto. Uh, so I have the DNA, the finance DNA. So uh, the transition has been, uh, you know, I wouldn't say seamless because it's only been a few days, but uh, well positioned to be able to make a seamless transition. We are going to talk budget making, but you'll understand my um, interest and curiosity in just uh, some more of the details around how you got this job. And I wonder whether you've had a chance to talk to Rod Phillips since he's come back from down south yet. I have, I have, and uh, you know, Rod. Rod uh, is a very good man, but uh, he made he made a, as in his own words, a, a dumb mistake, and uh, he took full responsibility for it. He paid uh, the political price, um, and now I've got to get on with the work of protecting families and and the health and well-being of all Ontarians, and uh, I'm going to work around the clock to do that, um, and uh, we've got a lot a lot to do. Do you think he needed to resign? Well, it's the decision he made, and I think uh, that you know I understand the the the, the anger out there, and uh, you know us politicians do get held to a higher standard, and but we know that going in, uh, we know that going in, um, and uh, so all of us uh, have chosen public service. Uh, we we have to uh, continue every day to to help people and and pay the price if uh, if we don't. So. Uh, that's part of the environment that we operate in. Um, but that was for a decision that he made and, and discussions with him and the Premier, so I'll leave it at that. You know, I don't want to infringe too much, not too much, on your private conversation with him. But, you know, the, the question everybody in Ontario has today is, why did he go south? Did you ask him that and did he give you an answer? You know, fr frankly, uh, no. He's paid a. He's he's admitted he's made a mistake, and he's paid a, a political price for that. Uh, and he took, uh, I think, the honorable route to resign. He uh, understood the anger of many Ontarians, and I can understand it. Uh, that uh, th that anger, but uh, the conversations uh, are private. But I will say this: he's been incredibly helpful, as we worked very closely together before this. And uh, he's been very helpful in the transition and very open and professional. So I, I really admire him for that. Okay. What impact do you think this whole brouhaha has had 
on the trustworthiness that the public holds your government in? Well, I think the number one priority, and has been throughout, is to focus on the health and well-being uh, of Ontarians, and 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 we're gonna we, that that's all that that's what we're focused on. Whether it's uh, providing uh, the support uh, in my role, particularly as a financial guy, to provide the fiscal supports for our healthcare system, whether it's vaccines or whether it's uh, frontline workers or infrastructure, whatever it takes, infection prevention and control, and so on, the long-term care. Uh, and making sure they're safe, uh, investing in the people and providing the supports um, and the education system. So we're going to continue to do uh, at work the, the plan that we've been working on um, to put that as our top priority. And uh, so that's not going to change. Uh, one last question, admittedly a little bit smart assy, but you'll understand why I'm asking it. I see Queen's Park in the background behind you. Is that legitimately the Legislative Assembly or is there something else going on here? Well, as you can see, the flag is flying. I'm just taking a look. Uh, so uh, I don't know how they would simulate. So it's a, it's a real live picture. I, I, I'm here in an expansive uh, building with virtually nobody here. Um, and so, but this, uh, this is where I, 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 I'm, I'm coming from. Um, and, you know, virtually all the meetings I have, including with my parents on Christmas Eve, uh, was Zoom, um, and with my cousins the day before, uh, which was a great way to actually talk to a lot of cousins that may, it's often difficult to, to talk with physically uh, by Zoom. And so I'm operating at Queen's Park with uh, in the Frost Building with uh, the legislature behind me. Okay, good. Let's get on to the budget. Are you going to take, I mean, the budget is normally a, you know, a, a year long process and you're getting thrown in there with about three months to go. So, or, or maybe less than three months to go. Have you asked the premier to, to give you an extension to let you bring the budget out later, just so you can have more time to get up to speed? The good news is, is that uh, I've been involved in budget making for the last two and a half years in this government. Uh, We've, uh, we've uh, worked very closely, the Premier, the previous uh, Finance Minister and, 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 and Rod, um, worked very closely together. As you know, uh, the Treasury Board is responsible for the expenditures and, and finance brings the revenue and the whole uh, budget document together. So I've had an inside role all the way through. And these things don't happen overnight. So we've been working some time on, on this budget. Uh, and I'm confident uh, working very closely with the Premier who's shown tremendous leadership uh, out there. He's out there every day uh, working hard. Uh, and my caucus colleagues who, who are doing the same. And we're doing all of this together uh, across party lines as well and across uh, uh, regional lines and, and federally. Um, so a lot of work has already been, been done and I'm going to continue to continue it on. When you say federally, have you had a chance to talk to Christian Freeland yet? I have. We had a, we've had a very good conversation and uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of work to do together. I know the the conversations uh, beforehand, uh, uh, Ottawa to, to Queen's Park have been ongoing on multiple levels. Uh, we're going to continue those, uh, those conversations. Uh, it's important that uh, we continue. I think the people of Ontario absolutely want us to work together, and I'm fully committed to work together. We have been, and I think constructively. I, I think that uh, we need to focus on some areas of common interest. Uh, the the healthcare system. We need to. We need more funding for our healthcare system. It, we need to spend the money because not only are we through the pandemic, but we have an aging population. We have a society that needs us collectively to invest more in healthcare. And by that, I'm sp speaking specifically about the Canada Health Transfer Program. And historically, we've gotten more money from Ottawa, but that's declined over the years to 22% of healthcare expense, expenditures. So we would like, and we've called along with the other provinces, um, to increase that to 35% of healthcare expenditures. And I think now is the time. We are in the crisis. Uh, this is where all hands on deck. We're putting the fiscal firepower to, uh, to do everything we can in the circumstances on our healthcare system to support them. But uh, we, need, we have to have long-term, sustainable financial plan to be able to de deliver health care and long-term care, and including mental health and addiction care to not just the people of Ontario, but, uh, but as well uh, the people of Canada. If she were to fulfill that ask, going from 22 to 35 percent, what dollar figure does that represent to the Treasury of Ontario? 
Well, it's a, it's a big number because our our uh, uh, expenditures in healthcare have gone up significantly. Um, so so it, it would be billions of dollars. Uh, and which leads me to my next question. Given that she's already running a deficit of almost $400 billion this year, what makes you think uh, you remotely have a shot at getting this? Well, I think we, we have a shot. We should have a shot because, first of all, it's the right thing to do. Uh, from a fiscal point of view, uh, we have the capacity to do that. Uh, we also have in this environment uh, historically low interest rates. You know, in our budget of uh, in November of 20, uh, uh, 2020, uh, our projection for funding of interest rates were 1.6%. Um, so we're at incredibly historically low interest rates. So we have the capacity and they have the capacity. And I think this is the right thing to do because we get a return from investing in the healthcare system and uh, we get a return for investing in, in people because. Um, we can't have a healthy economy without uh, healthy people. And so uh, at, as we turn the corner here, and I'm, I'm saying there's hope as we first priority focus on the pandemic, but we got to look around down the road a little bit and the economic recovery, I think will come back stronger than ever, particularly here in Ontario, but across Canada. Um, and, uh, and together, I think we'll, we'll, these types of investments in our healthcare system are, are the right thing to do. Uh, but they're, from a personal point of view, but they're the right thing to do from an economic point of view. You know, I was talking to one of your predecessors the other day, and when I say predecessors, I mean way back. Darcy McHugh, who was the Minister of, oh. well, Treasurer, as they then called the job, uh, in the province of Ontario back in the 1970s. And he said that if he knew anything about the finances of the province, and I think he does, you guys should be looking at increasing the harmonized sales tax uh, one or two points uh, because, um, well, in his view, you need the money and, and a lot of people wouldn't see it. Uh, is that an option for you? Well, first off, uh, uh, if he's watching, hi to the uh, Duke of Kent, uh, <laughs> an incredible individual, and I have met him, and I've actually uh, I've got his book, and I've read his book. So I, I like to learn from uh, my predecessors. So he's one of those who had an important role in this province. You know, historically, uh, that hasn't been the approach that I've uh, I've been um, a part of, nor the party, and, and our experience is pre the uh the pandemic and particularly now is not the right time to to uh, increase taxes um there'll be a time and place to look at the finances but right now we've been pre-pandemic we put in a lot of tax measures to support individuals our low-income family um tax was uh an individual tax was to to help uh, the lowest income people we reduced it to zero we reduced the small business uh, income tax by over 8% to help small businesses. This is pre-pandemic. And during, during the pandemic, we've provided uh, income relief for a tax relief for uh, employers. So, so we've increased the employer health care uh, health ta tax uh, from um, uh, 450,000 roughly of revenues to a million that they don't have to pay the uh, employer health tax. So we're try try we historically and continue to put in measures so that people, the risk takers of this province, the hardworking people of this province can reinvest in, in this province. And that's the way to, uh, to recovery. I want to take you back a little over a year and a half when you and I sat down in one of your other offices uh, to, uh, to do an interview for the On Poly podcast. And it was a lengthy interview. And I do remember you saying in that interview, and you were you know, less than a year on the job as a rookie MPP at the time, you said, I want to bring the language of business to the business of government. And I, I want to know whether or not you actually can run government like a business in the middle of a global pandemic. Well, what I said there and what I meant is, and I think it's very accurate, uh, is you've got to have a plan as you happen to have a business. You've got to know what success looks like. And that's how you uh, bring people along to your vision. So uh, very important in, in, um, in, in business and in government to have a plan. Uh, and I think... Uh, I remember sitting down with uh, one of the, uh, the, 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 the bargaining agents, uh, I don't mind saying, it was Smokey Thomas, and he asked me the same question. And I said, well, you know, we gotta, we got to have a plan, we got to measure it, and uh, we got we to gotta deliver on it. And he said, that's exactly what they do. And so it's a common language that uh, having a plan, um, making sure you know what success looks like, and implementing that plan is so key. So, so that, that, that phraseology still stands after going into government two and a half years. Okay, but, but I know from your background that you got into public life in order to bring the finances of the province of Ontario back into what you saw as 
you know, back into the black, if I can put it that way. You thought our deficits were too big, our percent debt to, as a percentage of our economy was too big. You're now going to be presiding over one of the largest deficits in Ontario history. And I know you didn't get into public life to do that, but I wonder whether this pandemic has made you rethink the role of government and what people rely on governments for. Well, it's a very fair question, Steve. Uh, I, I would say that uh, part of the reason I got into government was, uh, you know, I believe fundamentally that you you have to have a structural uh, balance that you can't, like families, you can't spend uh, forever uh, more than you take in. It's as simple as that. And you do that so that when you hit a crisis, uh, if you're a family or a small business, that you have the means to get through the crisis. And governments are no different. And so we are... Uh, we're a family that uh, maybe didn't save enough money in government beforehand. That's why I got into politics. We're now, we now have a crisis. I've said that, uh, you know, the long-term finances uh, are, are, and deficit are not sustainable or desirable, but right now they are necessary. Uh, we have a family emergency, so we're going to take care of that family emergency. And, um, and longer term, you know, we're going to have to get back to once we've uh, turn the corner. I, I have. I think there's hope. I believe there's hope. There is hope that we're gonna we're turning the corner in 2021. The economic recovery is what we're going to be very focused on as we turn that corner from a health pandemic to uh, to an economic one, and we'll come out stronger than before. So so those principles haven't um, haven't changed. They've just uh, the time frame has just changed a little bit. Uh, how much? Well, you know, stay tuned. Um, I, how many days on the job? Maybe four or five days on the job. So they give me a little bit of time. You know, historically, uh, Minister of Finance has a little bit more time to, from appointment to tabling a budget. But as I said before, um, I've, I've been involved in the budget process for the last two and a half years. And uh, I'm going to continue to work very closely with the Premier, who's been leading the charge in this province um, and, and doing a, a, an outstanding job to um, really do everything it takes to keep people safe in this province, but also an eye on, on the economic recovery. So we'll work closely together along with my cabinet and caucus colleagues who, you know, I've, there's, it, this is, takes a team and we've got a great team, uh, pound for pound, just an outstanding team and, and um, just stay tuned. I did a little checking and it's been 34 years since we had a Minister of Finance in Ontario who is also president of the Treasury Board of Cabinet. As a ministry, we've had other ministers of finance who also chaired a subcommittee of cabinet that looked at spending oversight in the way you do. But the double role you have, three and a half decades since Bob Nixon had those both roles. And I hope this is a fair question, but do you have too much power right now? That's a lot of power invested in one person. I'm focused, uh, first of all, I think maybe I'll give Bob Nixon a call. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and, uh, you know, this is the great thing about public service. I've had a lot of conversations, Steve, before the pandemic, during and after. It's not a partisan thing, and everyone wants to help. And that's what makes Ontarians so fantastic and Canadians so fantastic. So, so uh, good uh, memo to file on, on Bob. Uh, look, this isn't about power. This is about uh, dealing with the challenge at hand with my, with my colleagues and under the leadership of the Premier, and that is we are faced with an unprecedented pandemic. We have a healthcare crisis. Uh, we've got to support every element of, um, of the system, our healthcare system, our long-term care system, the mental health and addiction supports, our education system. We've made, um, look, we've put uh, record investments in place. Uh, we were, uh, before the pandemic, looking at about a $6 billion deficit. We're now looking at a $38.5 billion deficit. Mm -hmm. We've seen a massive recession uh, that we we are digging our way out of it, but we're we're not done yet. Um, so this is a, this is a team effort. Uh, you can't do it alone. And as I said earlier, uh, whether it's with the federal government providing supports, um, and doing what we need to do here provincially, uh, we'll get the job done. But we're going to turn the corner too. Um, there there is hope, and the economic recovery uh, is going to be a big focus of the whole Ontario team. I can tell you, incidentally, Mr. Nixon is 92 years old, living in Paris, Ontario, and still sharp as a tack. So you will enjoy the phone call if and when you make it. Um, Minister, Mr. President, whatever your title is right now, I guess both of them, I want to ask you one last thing, and I hearken back again to that On Poly podcast we did a year and a half ago, when you told us at that time that the former federal finance minister, Michael Wilson, uh, was kind of your political mentor and hero, and you really admired his commitment to public life. 
he, like you, gave up a big salary to come into public life. And um, I want to know, I guess a rather personal question here, uh, you now have the same job that he had, the same title anyway. You're both ministers of finance. And I wonder if, uh, how meaningful is that additional connection between the two of you for you? Well, it's profound, and, and thanks for uh, mentioning that, because uh, I got my political stripes, uh, first uh, being a Quebecer coming from Quebec and, and uh, Brian Mulroney, and uh, and then coming to Ontario, and I went up to the, I was a young kid, went well, relatively, went up to, to this guy and said, you need some help, and it was Michael Wilson, and uh, that started a, a lifelong uh, friendship. I saw how hard he worked in the riding. First off, that's where we met. And, but I also saw how hard he worked on behalf of the people of Canada in his various roles. And, and then out when he left public office again, how he continued that hard work, whether it was uh, in the mental health area, whether it was in the education system or cross-border as being ambassador to the U.S. This is or after he left government. And I thought, what a great role model. You've got to give back. Um, you know, I've told you the story of, of um, my parents being um, World War II refugees, uh, one in 44, and my father a little bit later with the Red Army advancing. And they could have gone to a lot of places. My mother's friend's family went to Venezuela. My family came to here on both sides. And I believe strongly that this is the best country in the world that allows people from all over to come together. And, uh, and to, but to do that, you can't take uh, what we have today for granted and give back. Public service is, is so critical if we're going to continue to pass on to the next generation um, a strong, a strong uh, country, a strong democracy. And Michael Wilson embodied that uh, to the core. So, so I do miss him. His counsel would be uh, very welcomed at this stage. But the good news is that there are a lot of other Canadians that I've been able to talk to who've gone in on all sides of the aisle to, to give me counsel, and they've been very giving of their time. Well, I guess I should let you go now because I'm betting Darcy McHugh and Bob Nixon are waiting for your phone call. Uh, Minister Bethlehem Falvey, it's good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Again, Happy New Year, and uh, we'll see you again down the road. Happy New Year to you and your family, Steve, and it's always good to see you. Thank you. Everyone knew the holidays this year would be anything but normal. But it's fair to say that few anticipated that would include the resignation of the Minister of Finance after an ill-advised trip south, that as lockdowns came into effect across the province. COVID-19 case numbers kept rising, but vaccination rates, not so much. It's all put Doug Ford staring down tough questions as we embark on 2021. With us now to debrief this rocky start to the year, we welcome in Burlington, Ontario, Laura Stone, reporter for the Globe and Mail's Queen's Park Bureau. In the Roncesvalles, West End part of the provincial capital, Alison Smith, founder and publisher of Queen's Park Today and co-host of the Canada Land podcast, Wag the Doug. And in the Bay Cloverhill neighborhood, right near Queen's Park, there's Brian Lilly, political columnist for the Toronto Sun. And let me start by wishing everybody a happy new year. It's good to see you three again. Uh, okay, well, let's get into this. Laura, when you heard the news that Rod Phillips was on vacation in St. Bart's, apparently against the advice being given to 14 and a half million other Ontarians. What was your initial reaction? My initial reaction was this isn't going to be good. Uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of people were expecting some hard questions over the holiday break about, you know, potentially visiting relatives or stopping by your parents' house outside. How are you going to celebrate Christmas? I don't think anyone saw coming to the extent that we have seen in Ontario and across the country, uh, the questions about travel internationally. And I don't think anyone would have expected a minister to actually hop on a plane and take a vacation. I think the interesting part of this story is how a, this news trickled out. I know that um, Brian and some others were, some other reporters were hearing potentially that Minister Phillips, Mr. Phillips was traveling, former Minister Phillips was traveling, um, trying to get answers about that. And then the initial defense from his office and, and the slow kind of demise of his uh, political standing in the Ford government um, over several days. So I think there's still some some tough questions to be asked on the part of Premier Ford, and he has not held a media availability 
since Mr. Phillips left cabinet, but he did admit in a, in kind of a, a public statement that he had known that his minister was traveling and he did not immediately call him back. So it begs the question of who else in his office knew and why the premier did not force his minister to come back immediately. Those are good questions. We're going to follow up on those in a second. But Brian, let, let me follow let me follow up on this first. Uh, yeah, you got rumblings that the former minister of finance was out of the country. Now, obviously, I don't want you to burn any sources, but but how did this news dribble out initially? It was being talked about all over the, the city by people who saying, I, I'd call somebody up for a different story and they'd say, uh, I'm not in St. Lucia because the initial rumor was that he was in St. Lucia. No, he was in St. Bart's because apparently St. Lucia isn't quite posh enough when you're trying to keep up with the Kardashians <laughs> and hang out with uh, Chrissy Teigen and John Legend, which... You know, I'm not sure Rod Phillips was actually there with them, but they were all in St. Bart's together, the playground of the super rich. So, you know, his office just wouldn't say anything. It was days and days of denial and obfuscation. And then, you know, as I'm taking some downtime, sitting at home like everyone else, um, it comes out that uh, he's off in St. Bart's. This was absolutely bizarre. It, and then the calm strategy of just dribbling it out, as, as Laura was saying, was awful. R rather than just rip the Band-Aid off all, all at once, they put out a little bit at a time. Oh, 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 yeah, and he went to Switzerland in August, and oh, yeah, he did this. You know, you've got to get it all out there at once. I think his demise was partly their calm strategy, partly covering it up, like taking a sweater to St. Bart's to do a Zoom call. Uh, all of these things played into Rod Phillips' demise. And yeah, later this week, when Premier Ford does finally get out there and, and face questions, there's going to be some tough ones. Allison, when something like this happens, immediately there is a huge discussion among people in the Premier's office, people in the Minister of Finance's office, elsewhere. What do we do about this? Is, d does he have to resign right away, or is there some way we can skate through this? Was it immediately clear to you and the people you talked to that the only way out of this was a resignation? I think the you know real bad news for Rod Phillips on this happened to be the week that it happened. You know, most people in Ontario were home, probably a little bored and really ready to get angry about this. What Premier Ford did do was respond, you know, with the resignation, although it was, a, you know, it was a slow dribble in some ways. He, we, we, it, it all happened within, you know, three to four days. Whereas we have Premier Jason Kenney in Alberta who waited until yesterday to, uh, you know, have his, one of his ministers resign who had been in Hawaii. It turned out six members of the government caucus had been traveling abroad there. So I do think in some ways, you know, it wasn't the fastest move the Ford government's ever made, but it could have been slower. And you, you saw how quickly they, had uh, our new finance minister, Peter Bethlen Falvey, in the lieutenant governor's office getting sworn in. That happened on Friday. So I think they are trying to move past it, and it could have been worse for them if they did wait a day or two longer. However, the problem, you know, for the PCs now becomes they ha are on their third finance minister in, in less than three years in office. They need a budget out uh, within a couple months. And now they have Peter Bethlen Falvey running two of the biggest portfolios, uh, you know, in the province. So it's not good for Ford, you know, just on the managerial sense of, of running Ontario. Well, let me follow up on that because, and Laura, this will circle back to the point you initially made. Premier Ford apparently knew that his former minister of finance was in St. Bart's. He knew it for a period of time, and yet he didn't do anything about it until the news became public. What do we think of all that? Well, I think when you talk to those who are close to Rod Phillips, they say that he's the one to blame. He made the decision to go. It wasn't the premier's decision, and so Rod Phillips should wear this. I think this raises larger questions about the protocol and um, and the control that the premier has over his own caucus and ministers. How can a minister just leave the country and ostensibly not tell anyone or tell very few people? Um, and I take the premier at his word until we know or hear otherwise that he did not know that Mr. Phillips had left the country until after he had arrived in St. Bart's. So 
it does kind of raise a lot of uncomfortable questions about what happens behind the scenes um, before it's revealed to the public and how much is covered up. I mean, surely the premier would not have raised this publicly had it not been revealed by journalists. Uh, no, that's the and, point. And, and, the and, media. I, and exactly. And I, so yeah. how much happens that we don't know about? And so, you know, is, is the premier ultimately to blame for this? He is the leader and he does have to take responsibility. But Mr. Phillips was an extremely uh, strong and prominent member of Mr. Uh, Ford's cabinet. He had a lot of power and he obviously used that to have his advantage in order to take this trip. Yeah, Allison, I'm trying to explore what the premier's responsibility is in this case. If as he has said, he didn't find out about this trip to St. Bart's until after his former finance minister was already there. Does he, when he finds that out, not have to say to Rod Phillips, get your butt back here right away, Buster. Do you know what this might do to our government if you get found out? He didn't do that. He didn't. And I think another part of the, you know, the St. Bart's trip that I particularly grilled the public was how long, you know, how long Rod Phillips was there. He got there on December 12th or December 13th. That's, you know, weeks before Christmas. Uh, and he'd apparently been planning to stay until past New Year's. So, you know, I, maybe does a, a, does a minister need a, a little vacation? Sure, maybe not abroad during a pandemic. Do they need a four week vacation? I don't think so. So you're right that the premier he, you know, if you talk to the opposition parties, they want the premier to to really take a hit on this. And I think the fact that the premier hasn't been, you know, out in front of Ontarians for a news briefing since that happened, I, there's a reason why he doesn't want to answer these questions, and he doesn't want to have to admit the fact that you know his finance minister sort of betrayed him. Okay, Brian. There's sort of three parts to this story. One is the original decision that. Former Minister Phillips took to take this trip to St. Bart's. The second part is the Premier's role in this, what he did or didn't do or should or should have done. Mm. And the third part is the, is the absolutely bizarre communications approach that former Minister Phillips' office took by tweeting out pictures of him apparently working his riding while he was away <laughs> or doing little pieces to camera wishing people Merry Christmas and Happy New Year in front of a fireplace while sipping on eggnog. I'm not meaning to be mean about this, but, but I am going to ask the question, why did it not occur to anybody in his office that this would clearly look like deceptive behavior and it was a dumb idea to do? The most deceptive part to me, and you're right, Steve, he, he had all those tweets planned and a politician can defend it or media people can defend it and say, well, you know, over the holidays, we always pre-program things. And I get that. And nobody expects a video Christmas message from their elected official to be actually broadcast live on their Twitter feed at 9.45 on Christmas Eve. No, we know that if that shows up, it's pre-recorded. But the biggest thing is something I already mentioned. He did Zoom calls with community leaders back home while he's in St. Bart's, and the Liberals put it out on Twitter saying, oh, you can hear the water behind there. I'm not sure you can hear the water. I'll leave that up for other people to debate. What is undebatable is that Rod Phillips had a shirt, a collared shirt, and a sweater on. The average daily high temperature in St. Bart's is 29. The low is 24. He planned to look like he was sitting in a warm, cozy office in Ajax somewhere or in his Rosedale home when he was actually in St. Bart's. That is the level of deception that the public couldn't stand. You know, as far as whether the premier knew or did, didn't know, I believe that he didn't know when Phillips went. Uh, so I'll believe him on that. And that's Phillips' decision. Ford didn't act, and this is what he has to wear, he didn't act in calling him back right away. Laura, let's do one more question on this, and that is, uh, I have heard people say that during the course of this pandemic, certainly starting uh, maybe as far back as April, that, um, that Doug Ford managed to build some kind of bridge of trust between himself and the electorate that clearly had not been there in the first year and a half of his administration. What do you think the status of that bridge is, given the developments of the last week or so? Well, I think certainly Premier Ford had a significant bump with the public, as you say, Steve, at the beginning, because he was out every day. He was answering questions. He was showing a side of his personality that maybe not everyone had a chance to see yet, because the media strategy early on in the Ford government had been to shield 
shield him from the public and he had an acrimonious relationship with the media and that did change and I think that he did win over a lot of people who had not voted for him or maybe thought I don't know if I really would vote for him, but right now I, I'm supporting his leadership. I think as you've seen uh, in challenges with the vaccine rollout, certainly with long-term care and the way that the province has handled the second wave and uh, the, the increased number of outbreaks that we're seeing there. And then with this latest trip, um, I do think there's a reason why Mr. Ford, Premier Ford has not been in front of the cameras uh, as much as he once was, and he has resorted to hiding away a little bit or not coming out as proactively as he once did because he is now facing m a much more disillusioned public and much more difficult questions than he had initially when this pandemic started. All right, you mentioned the word second wave there, so let's pick up the story there. And Brian, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, we all knew a second wave was coming. It's been predicted since the summertime. It has been intense. How well do you think the province has planned in terms of its administration of vaccine rollout, uh, long-term care homes, the whole gamut? How well are we doing in this second wave? Well, much like the first wave, we're being hit hardest in long-term care. Um, look, there's a, a world of difference between the first wave and the second wave. Infection rates are much higher. Uh, that would be worrisome if hospitalizations and uh, uh, and, and the worst outcome, ICU admissions followed by deaths, if those were trending in the same trajectory as infections. They're not. That's good news. So there's a few reasons for that. We've got better, uh, better treatments, and, and that's not just Ontario, that's around the world. Um, the it, uh, hospitalizations are, are not rising at the same rate of infections, neither ICU nor death. That's the good part. But long-term care homes are still being hit hard, and we all know the reason why people are carrying it in. The premier has said how many times, it, it, and that's why we're vaccinating uh, frontline PSWs and nurses that work in these places first, is you know the residents aren't bringing COVID-19 into the homes. They're not going anywhere. It, it's out in the community, and that's you know the most vulnerable people for this virus are people that live in long-term care. That is the sore spot. I think that the province has done well on schools. I think that, you know, as far as the vaccination rollout, I don't think they were ready. They were planning for December 31st. They got the vaccine two, almost three weeks early. Uh, and I think it's showing up in, in the numbers. Um, about 50,000 people vaccinated so far. That's good. It's not fast enough if we want to get to where we need to be come spring. Well, we like to deal with empirically provable facts on this program, so let's throw some at you guys and our viewers right now. Sheldon, I'll ask you if you would. We've got a couple of graphs here that we want to show, and for those listening on podcast who can't see these graphs, uh, I'll just describe them in some detail. We've basically got two sets of figures that we want to show here, and there's a vast blue area which shows how many vaccines have been distributed, and unfortunately, uh, for the Canadian population, there is a massive gap between the amount of vaccines distributed and the amount of vaccines that have actually been administered. That administered number is a heck of a lot smaller than the number of vaccines that have been distributed. So there's a vaccine gap there, and that's a problem. Let's flip over to the next chart, and we'll follow that up with this. This is a bar graph that shows vaccine doses administered as a percentage of the population. And I guess not surprisingly, Prince Edward Island is first. They've got a fairly small compact population, so they're easy to get the vaccine administered to. But look along the provinces there, Alberta, British Columbia, there's the Canadian average. Oh my goodness, Quebec, Newfoundland, Labrador, Saskatchewan, Ontario, finally, Ontario, well down the list of provinces in the country when you consider the percentage of the population that has had vaccine doses administered. And Laura, let me bring you in at this point and uh, have you tell us what's going on here. <laughs> well, that chart's really troubling, uh, Steve, and a little surprising because I think the government put a lot of credence behind Rick Hillier as the chair of the, va the vaccine task force. He came out how many times before Christmas and said that Ontario would be ready, they're going to treat this um, as a wartime exercise. I, I do agree with Brian that they do that the government seems to have been a little thrown off by uh, the timeline of when they received this these vaccines. And there clearly are challenges with the Pfizer vaccine and where that needs to be stored, but this doesn't really jive with um, 
the way Premier Ford has talked about bureaucracy and red tape um, and thinking outside the box. I mean, why aren't more hospitals administering this? Why aren't the hours longer? Why aren't they bringing in uh, various healthcare professionals to help out with it? Why are we kind of stuck in these this uh, these silos of administering this vaccine in a way that is really limiting the number of people that are receiving it. I know the government is providing an update on this and we're expecting them to take a much more aggressive stance on the vaccine rollout, but this is the only way out of this. It's the only way the province is going to come back to any semblance of normality is to get the most vulnerable people inoculated from COVID-19. And the public is losing patience with the government and the pace of this. Allison, what would you add to that in terms of helping us understand why the, why the province appears to be somewhat more flat-footed in its response uh, to all of what's been going on than it should be? Yeah, I think what is glaring is the gap between, you know, Premier Doug Ford was out on the tarmac uh, at four o'clock in the morning in a reflective vest the day that the Pfizer vaccines first landed in Canada and or in Ontario. But where is that urgency right now uh, to, to get them in people's arms? We saw yesterday that the GTHA mayor's coalition sort of suggesting that people can't even get to the vaccine distribution centers and that the province should be doing more to help people be transported to these places. Perhaps that's something that the province didn't think about. And, and when I think about the vaccine task force headed up by Rick Hillier, you know, uh, Doug Ford says he has so much confidence in this group. But then I, I think back to the the provinces and the premier's health table that we were told, you know, over months and months, how much confidence he had in this group that was advising him. And then the auditor general, Body Lysak, comes out and tells us that this health table in a lot of cases was, you know, up to 500 people all on a conference call talking over each other. So, you know, the vaccine task force, I don't have any details about what's going on on the inside, but it's very possible that the actual bureaucracy and the way that these ad hoc groups are working on the day to day isn't as effective as they should be or that Doug Ford has is trying to tell us that they are. Well, I, I, I guess, Brian, we should say, lest we leave this all at the feet of the premier and Rick Hillier, uh, I saw your piece the other day in which you suggested that there are public servants in the bureaucracy who, in your view, uh, have not been helpful to the cause either. Uh, why don't you just sum up that column for us, if you would? Oh, I, I think that was on, on long-term care from, from a while ago. But look, all through this, uh, there is an ongoing fight between uh, bureaucracies and the government over how you get things done. You know, uh, testing in pharmacies, uh, te asymptomatic testing uh, of high school students or uh, in hot zones or of uh, people working in long-term care all uh, actually opposed by the uh, by the health bureaucrats who are supposed to run the system. And it took politicians saying, no, we're getting it done. You're going to do it. We're in charge to actually do some of those things, which were helpful. Well, now we need that for the vaccine rollout because you know, these silos that, uh, that Allison was talking about, they're very real and people become rigid and they say, well, this is the way we've always done it. So we have to keep doing it that way. No, we're in an emergency. We're in a pandemic. Break down those silos. Go after uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, you know, you've got some hospitals that are absolutely crushing it. You know, on Ontario, by the way, was being crushed by Quebec. If, you know, I don't think PEI is a valid uh, comparison, as you said, they're very small, but Quebec was crushing it. Ontario's catching up. We've gone from just about 13,000 a week ago to a, just shy of 50,000 now. That's a good improvement, but not good enough. How do we catch up? Well, new ways of doing things, have all the hospitals running full tilt, not having Ottawa be, you know, at, at twice the rate of uh, UHN in Toronto. You know, these are things that can't be happening when one of the biggest health centers in the country, never mind the province, is lagging other parts of the province. In the midst of that answer, Brian also introduced the idea that uh, our long-term care uh, home situation is something that we ought to look into right now. So, Laura, let's start some conversation about that. Uh, I guess the big news to emerge this week is that the people who are doing this sort of independent task force look 
at the situation in long-term care. They want some more time to get their report together. And the minister of long-term care has said, no, nope, we're sticking to the original deadline. Uh, what's, the, what's the verdict on that decision so far? Well, the commission had asked until December 31st, which is quite a long extension. The report is due uh, at the end of April. So they were asking until the end of this year to get their report done. And, and I think that's simply to take into account uh, all the facile, the uh, the details of the second wave and the way that the government has had or had not prepared homes for that and as we're seeing kind of the devastating impacts of that uh, and they also say that the government has not provided them with enough information um, in order to complete their report and we talk about the bureaucracy uh, the ministry of long-term care has to now go through hundreds and, and thousands of pages of, of documents and information to provide this to the commission but the commission needs to do a thorough job to to, to understand what has gone wrong in long-term care and how the government did or did not prepare for both the first and especially the second wave i think that's particularly how what the public views as unforgivable that the government would not have been prepared the second time around knowing full well the impacts um on long-term care and the residents and and having various staff coming in and and we know there's staff shortages and why weren't they preparing for that from the government's perspective though having this independent commission um, was intended to speed this process along. We have gone through in pub, uh, public inquiries into long-term care and they didn't want to drag this process out for years. So there's a push and pull there uh, in terms of timeliness from the government's perspective and, and, um, and the commission pushing for a more fulsome investigation of exactly what went wrong. I think the public would side more with the fulsome investigation but they certainly aren't prepared to wait for two or three more years to get those answers. Well, that's the thing. Allison, I, I, I guess we should just clarify for people, this is not a full-blown you know, public inquiry where there are lawyers for all sides and it's televised and you have witnesses being brought up and sworn under oath and so on and so forth. This was supposed to be, these are not the government's words, but this was supposed to be a kind of quick and dirty, let's get to the bottom of this and figure out what we can do going forward quickly. Uh, the fact that the government wants to stick to the original timeline, does that suggest to you that they are anxious to get these recommendations and get moving on them, or is there something else at play here? I think the, com well, the commission has three, three commissioners. They have been, you know, doing a lot of public hearings, and we have been getting good information out of them. One of the things they fought for was the right for people to speak before the commission anonymously uh, out of risk of not losing their job. Right now, the SEIU of Ontario, a, a long-term care workers union, is calling on the commission to actually have the premier and Minister Fullerton, you know, speak and before them and compel statements from them. I think if that happened, that would be a real game changer out of the information we get. But right now, uh, you know, we'll have to see what comes of it. In April, I think that is, you know, too soon in a lot of ways. I kind of agree that the commission should have more time because this, this scenario, this, you know, disaster in long-term care is still happening right now. I mean, the question of last week, you know, for a little while was where in the world is Rod Phillips? The better question might be, where is Marilee Fullerton, the Minister of Long-Term Care? We have seen rising, rising deaths in long-term care, protests outside sites uh, such as tender care in Scarborough, where at least 60 residents have died very recently. And all we hear from, you know, from Minister Fullerton is, you know, these news releases she sends out every few days saying that another long-term care home has been handed over, its management's been handed over to a hospital. And, you know, that keeps happening over and over again. Hospitals on their own are, you know, dealing with COVID outbreaks and COVID wings. And now they're being asked to ever more frequently also run these long-term care homes. One of these homes just yesterday was on on St. George Street, right downtown Toronto, less than two kilometers from Queen's Park. And we're just not seeing leadership from Minister Fullerton on this file. She's not talking to Ontarians and she's not 
you know, addressing these challenges, especially the staffing challenge, as it keeps progressing and keeps getting worse. Brian, to the extent anybody remembers anything Premier Ford had to say about long-term care homes, it was this expression he used, we're going to put an iron ring around them, an iron ring of safety around them. How close are we to a set of circumstances where that iron ring is, in fact, in place the way you read it? Uh, it wasn't in place in the spring, and it won't be now. I bet he regrets those words more than uh, most others that he's spoken during this pandemic. But we have to be realistic. This is not to excuse the government uh, of Ontario. You look around the world at who is hardest hit. You look at who dies um, from COVID-19. And it is disproportionately people with comorbidities over the age of 80, which perfectly describes people in long-term care homes. If you are you know, in your 70s or 80s and, and, and fit and healthy, uh, as my parents are, your survival rate from COVID-19 is extremely high. It's very good. Uh, if you are dealing with underlying conditions and in, in a frail state, which is why you end up in a long-term care home, uh, well, you're looking at about a, a mortality rate of between 25 and 29 percent. Um, so the, I, I'm not sure what any government could do to stop this. This doesn't excuse them. And as far as extending the commission, I think December is too long. We do need answers sooner and we need action sooner, uh, more than words. But Sticking to April, probably uh, not the best idea. You know, give them to June, June, give them to July. But if you continually extend these sorts of things, they go on to the point, Steve, how many times have we all covered public inquiries where by the time they wrap up, you forget why they were called. And then you've got, you know, the public has to be reminded of why this was ever there in the first place. It's why I supported the idea of a, a quick and dirty one, as you said but give them a little more time because we're still in the middle of this. No, you make a good point. I, I think we all remember the, uh, the child abuse inquiry in eastern Ontario, which went on for a decade, I think, before uh, the government eventually had to pull the plug on that thing. Uh, let's, we've just got a few minutes to go here, and uh, you're all politics reporters, so I want to get your political sense of where the government is right now. I mean, it was only a few months ago that this government was so popular that there was a lot of speculation that they might try to call an early election to take advantage of their unusually high popularity. I don't hear much of that talk anymore. Where are they at in terms of popularity right now? Laura, start us off. Well, I'm sure there are many in conservative circles who wish that the government had called that early election um, because that probably would have ensured another majority uh, mandate for the Ford government, um, you know, particularly with the child, some of the challenges that the opposition has faced throughout in terms of getting their voices heard and their messages, but that's getting stronger and stronger, I would say, as more of these uh, problems are exposed. I think the biggest question for the government now is, do they stay the course or do does Premier Ford bring in even harsher restrictions in Ontario. I think that all plays into these travel stories and whether the public will is there to even listen to elected officials at this point, um, how much you know, public will uh, is, is there. Um, and uh, I also think that um, we're, you know, that Ontario has often followed the lead of Quebec. So it will depend on whether they do bring in things like curfews, which Premier Ford has resisted up until now. Uh, but this is a very, very challenging time for the Ford government. I think we're entering a dark January and February. Uh, we're going to have to see some more movement on vaccinations in order to get some of that hope back for the public. But right now, I think people are feeling pretty down and pretty disillusioned with where we're at in terms of the numbers of this pandemic and how we're going to see our way out of it. Let's do a minute to Allison and a minute, and a minute to Brian. Allison, go ahead. Yeah, I think that the problem the Ford government is facing right now is where what are their options for a good news announcement? You know, the vaccine coming in was that, but it's, it's all it's going to be for, you know, the next months is, you know, a very slow tick up those bar graphs that you showed us earlier, Steve. There's not a lot of opportunity for them to spin any of this in their favor to divert bad news, uh, you know, through good news, which is something that political parties love to do. We're, there's no, you know, shining light at the, the end of this, at least until the spring. 
So I think there's going to be a lot of pollsters out there since the Rod Phillips issue trying to get an actual handle on what Ontarians are thinking about the PC government, but they're they're running low on opportunities to put the electorate in a good mood with their governance. Last word to Brian Lilly. Okay, so the, uh, the the most angry people over Rod Phillips uh, and what happened there were were PC voters and and their backers. So that's going to hurt them in, in terms of uh, popular support, especially among the small business community, which, as you know, will flip between liberals and conservatives based on uh, any given election and and what the issues are. But they've been losing the small business vote with these lockdowns because they feel that they haven't been getting the support they need and they're taking the brunt of it. They also lost. I I think a bit of support that they were getting from the general public who hadn't been in their corner before, who felt that they didn't lock down hard enough or soon enough. So the government's in a bit of a pickle in trying to say, okay, we're going to lock down, but not quite so hard. And then some people get nervous. Ontario is the most nervous province in the country when it comes to COVID-19. Ford has been skating along a, a, a very fine line on that, and he may have lost his balance the last little bit. Our thanks to Laura Stone from the Globe and Mail, Adelson Smith from Queen's Park Today, Brian Lilly from the Toronto Sun. Once again, Happy New Year, everybody, and thanks for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, January 5th, 2021. As much as COVID was the story of 2020, it's still, of course, dominating our lives this year. Tomorrow, we'll hear from epidemiologists about what it's been like to suddenly take center stage as they try to help stop the spread. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.